Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this CCTL seminar on deciding what to decide. Leave applications to the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. My name is Rehana Viratna. I am an associate professor at CUHK Law, and I'm the chair of our Comparative Constitutional Law Research Forum, which organized this talk. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Evan Rosevier, who will be giving the seminar. Let me just give a brief introduction, and then we'll get right to it. Um, so Dr. Rosevier is a global academic fellow at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. He holds a PhD in political science and a JD from the University of Toronto. His research lies at the intersection of comparative law and comparative politics, with a focus on national constitutions and domestic legal systems. It is guided by a desire to understand how courts, rights, and constitutions operate, how they interact with other states and non-state actors, and whether they are capable of fostering social and political change. Methodologically, his research takes the form of theoretically informed, empirically driven comparative analysis that involves single case and small end research, supplemented by large end statistical analysis. Um, and you will see that methodological approach in action uh, today in the seminar. Uh, so welcome, Evan, thank you very much. Let me also introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Stuart Hargreaves, um, a colleague of mine here at uh, CUHK Law. Um, I've invited Stuart to offer some comments on the paper. So the way this will go is that Evan will introduce the paper for about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, Stuart will then offer some brief comments. Um, I may as well offer some brief comments and questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor. If anyone has uh, any questions, um, please just send those to me via the chat, um, and then I will um, read them out uh, to Evan. So with that said, Evan, uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Stuart and Rahan, for being here. Thank you to CUHK, uh, CUHK for uh, having me, and if you'll pardon my silence for just a moment, I will share some slides with you. Okay, uh, I'm going to assume everyone can see at this point, hopefully. Um, and I will say uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming out to, to hear this. Um, this is sort of my first foray into the Hong Kong legal system, uh, per se. Um, and I will also note that uh, what I'll be presenting on has morphed slightly from uh, from what the the abstract for the presentation was. It's it's changed from more of a report style to something more of a traditional social science argument uh, where I'll be discussing sort of two competing visions of courts um, and litigation more generally and looking at what the evidence in Hong Kong has to say about it. Um, as is standard in, in social science methodology, we start with the puzzle, right? Uh, which is on the one hand, we have this body of literature that begins with Mark Galanter's 1974 article, uh, Why the Haves Come Out Ahead. And here we, we have this picture of courts as procedurally neutral forms where judges simply apply the law, but for a variety of structural reasons to do with the availability of resources, the normative slant of the law, um, the haves being individuals or, well, predominantly organizations, especially corporate entities and governments, tend to come out ahead. Right? They are all else being equal, more likely to win. On the other hand, um, based also a, a significant amount on, on U.S. literature, um, we might be able to attribute this to someone like uh, Charles Epp. We have this idea as courts, as political institutions that are constrained by the law, but are sort of manned by or populated by judges who have ideological beliefs, um, who are concerned with the advancement of their power and prestige, um, and the legitimacy of the court and seek to shape the, and shape their decisions accordingly. Um, we would look at this in contemporary terms as advancing some sort of rights culture, um, challenging states, challenging sort of creeping notions of authoritarianism or threats to democracy. Um, and these two things obviously don't sit well together. Right? Th this idea of courts as ideologically motivated, constrained by law, or courts as neutral bodies also constrained by law. 
<clears throat> so the, the context I'll be looking at this in as is given away, I think pretty clearly by the, the title of this presentation is decisions made by the appeal committee of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. Um, the first sort of vision of courts is, is known broadly speaking as party capability theory. Um, so the question here is, does party, cap party capability theory apply to Hong Kong, specifically at the Court of Final Appeal? The second is, can we find any ideological or corporate interests um, at work in the decisions? I'll assume we're largely on the same, same page here. If we, if we are at a, a CUHK presentation, we have a broad understanding of, of what the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal is. Um, largely discretionary docket, um, particularly post-2014, um, when the as-of-right appeals were abolished. Um, to the extent that the court does make decisions about what it hears, it's done by the appeal committee. Um, three members, variable composition. The, the bulk of the work is done by the permanent justices. The chief justice sits 30 to 35% of the time, and it, it includes uh, local non-permanent judges. Generally speaking, it's only included non-permanent judges who were previously uh, members of the court as permanent judges uh, who have subsequently retired due to mandatory retirement. Um, the universe of cases we'll be looking at here is uh, 1,016 leave applications um, decided or heard since uh, July 1st, 1997, um, and the data set ends on June 30th of, of this year. Um, there has been an increasingly increasing likelihood of leave being granted over time. 33% um, in the aggregate, it's a lot closer to 40, 43. Um, in the most recent years, but then we have the issue of Rule Seven, sort of eliminating some of the uh, some of the chaff, some of the unmeritorious claims that really ought not be heard by a panel of judges to begin with. Uh, one more thing to note is I've treated these decisions as largely unanimous. There are five decisions that are explicitly non-unanimous, um, but no dissenting reasons are given. It should also be noted that um, Justice Bokari was present at all five. Uh, are on all five of these um, non-unanimous decisions um, and identified as the dissenting judge in, in uh, three of them, I believe. Um, so, I mean, we can talk about that in, in the in the Q&A if we'd like. Having set the contact here, uh, I'll run through a bit of the, the theory on both sides here, and then we will uh, move on to some, some ugly looking tables uh, which are always difficult to present in this context, but which are necessary to sort of grasp the, the meaning of, of the numbers, what's going on here. So there's a variety of ways to, to break down party capability theory. I've, I've chosen a sort of fourfold four, four typology here. Um, and these are the mechanisms that are at work, uh, at least in theory. So when we have the content of the law, we can look at unequal outcomes as the result of what is almost a sort of um, neorealist or even neo-Marxist perspective, which sees the law as a means of reinforcing or entrenching um, pre-existing social inequalities. Basically, corporate interests, those with power and influence are able to shape the law such that there is this institution of the state that continually reinforces their privilege and advantage. And this is fairly common uh, understanding of the law. It is what we see sort of rejected um, as a legitimate way of running the state in most socialist legal theory. Um, and I, I think it's relatively intuitive. Um, we also have a little bit more practically the, the concept of legal representation. Basically, all of this is, is to come down to if you have more money, if you have more time, you are able to hire better lawyers, plan your litigation more effectively, advance stronger legal arguments, um, navigate the informal norms of the legal system more, uh, more efficiently, and utilize procedure to delay or advance um, sort of proceedings as you deem necessary. So more money, better lawyers, better outcomes. Also relatively straightforward. Um, the litigant goals is a little bit more complicated to understand and explain, but we're basically dividing this up into individuals and organizations. Organizations here uh, comprising both business or corporate entities and state institutions. And the idea is that in any given legal dispute, 
individual parties, um, what are often referred to as the have nots, although that's problematic for several reasons, um, are generally concerned only with winning the dispute at hand. They seek to be vindicated by the law um, insofar as someone will go to jail uh, or they will be released from jail, as the case may be, or they want a settlement of some type. Organizations, on the other hand, obviously also seek to win the dispute at hand, but are concerned, often even more concerned, with obtaining a favorable pre precedent. Um, they are unwilling to, to lose in a way that will negatively impact them going down the road when they engage in similar behavior, opening them up to similar lawsuits from different individuals. So this is where you might see an organization settle, um, perhaps for a large sum of money in some type of civil lit litigation in order to avoid having to pay out in the long run substantially more as other individuals who have been uh, subject to what is deemed to be illegal or improper behavior come forward and also seek wins um, as a result of a favorable pre precedent. And then we get into something a little bit more um, uh, ambiguous, but it's the idea of external factors. Organizations, they're better able to strategically choose what litigation they advance. So this is going back to this little litigant goals idea, settlement versus litigation, whether or not to appeal in a certain situation. And they're also better able to comply with the letter of the law. Um, they are able to hire in-house counsel. They are able to strategically plan such that even if they are doing something that is very much on the margins of illegality, they always stay or usually stay on the right side. Something that an individual who is operating sort of in the world is not going to be concerned, uh, concerned with in the same fashion. So there's a few ways that these have been operationalized um, in the existing literature, which is largely US, but has been expanded out pretty significantly over the past sort of 10, 12 years. Um, litigant status is the most standard way to look at this, at least from a straight up party capability uh, perspective. Um, and to do that, I've employed an order typology, which is, there's a, a few ways it's been done in the literature. This is fairly standard. Uh, you number the types of litigants um, in ascending order of resources that are on, whole, on the whole um, available to them. Obviously, not every individual is a have not, and not every organization is um, particularly wealthy. But on balance, these are these, this is the level of advantage we're expecting, running from individual through to the state um, involved in criminal prosecutions. I've also thrown in um, a dummy variable, which just indicates whether or not the litigant is self-represented or not. The, the obvious expectation here is those that are self-represented uh, are going to perform more poorly um, if party capability theory holds. In terms of legal representation, um, there are, I can talk about why I chose the, this approach. There are some more analytically preferable, um, but data availability next to impossible ways to do this. So what I've used is the number of counsel um, on either side and the number of silks being either senior counsel here or QCs brought in. Um, and then I've calculated scores for each of these, which are basically the uh, respondent side subtracted from the appellant side. And that gives you a capability score. The example of this would be if we had an individual uh, filing a leave application where an organization was the respondent, the individual has a score of one, the organization has a, a score of two, two subtracted from one is negative one, we would get a capability score of negative one. And so the, the range of possible outcomes here is negative four to positive four. Negative four being an individual uh, advancing a criminal appeal, appeal against uh, the HKSR or the public prosecution, the uh, director of public prosecutions. Um, and then when I did counsel, I used the square root, and this is to account for diminishing returns. Right? You don't get the same benefit from adding a third lawyer to your two lawyers as you would from adding a second lawyer to your first lawyer. The, a relatively standard way to approach this. Um, and this is just a, a quick sort of overview of the quote unquote net advantage. This is also a standard metric used in the literature um, of individuals through the large organizations. So what you're doing here is counting the number of times individuals win um, or successful in their leave applications versus 
the number or the percentage of time they lose when they are the respondent. And, and the idea here is you, you use the win and the loss percentage to sort of neutralize the fact that, uh, particularly in the Hong Kong Court of Appeal, you, you actually see only about 30, 30 to 35 percent of uh, leave applications granted. So you would expect the net advantage here to be zero if everyone was treated exactly the same and there was no systematic variation. And what you see confirms pre-existing uh, theory as well as empirical studies of US, Canada, Australia, and a large number of, of other common law jurisdictions. Individuals are the most likely to be unsuccessful, balanced out. The government in criminal prosecutions is the most likely to be successful. You also do see um, some variation in terms of the average number of counsel and silks. Um, moving on, we look at judicial factors. Um, and I've, I've broken down three here. One is the institutional role, and this is just how the court perceives itself. You have this conceptual distinction you can make with an appellate court that is the idea of a court of almost like a, a civil law court of cassation, where their principal role is to ensure that the law is applied correctly, the law that pre-exists out there in the ether that is the complete covering the field civil code is applied correctly at all levels. On the other hand, you have the more traditional common law uh, approach, which is of the apex court as ensuring the uniform application of the law, developing the law in response to new legislation, changing social mores, all of these types of things where it's, it's more of a policy role, not quite politics, but ensuring that the law develops as it is intended to. Um, so here we would expect um, issues that are premised on the existence of some sort of dramatic injustice, say in a criminal prosecution, um, to be rejected by an apex court. That's why we have an appellate court. That's why we have the Court of Appeal here in, in Hong Kong. They deal with that. So the Court of Final Appeal is free to ensure the law develops correctly. Um, to the extent it's more of a court of cassation, we should see a rejection of the points of law and ensuring that the sort of injustices or incorrect application of the law are dealt with. We also have the institutional interests. And here, I think, is where we're getting a little bit more into um, untrodden territory, I suppose, at least empirically in the context of Hong Kong. Um, and this builds on existing political science literature, um, as well as some law and society literature. But we have this idea that courts may, particularly at the apex level, may be predisposed to side with the have-nots, the little guys, in order to cultivate their own institutional legitimacy as they sort of engage in this battle for horizontal authority with the executive and legislative branches, and in order to sort of overcome perceptions of, in the context of the Philippines, perceptions of corruption of the government, and maintain their own sort of prestige and power, the courts will often side against business and at times the state. Um, at least this is generally applicable to about 70 to 2000 is, is when, the, when the studies have been uh, conducted. They will be looking to advance the interests of individuals, gain popular legit legitimacy, gain public trust, and become a more effective institution. On the other hand, you have a, a, a US style literature um, which is based on the idea that courts can be overruled and frequently will be overruled if they step too far out of line. If they're, they have a margin of appreciation with the executive, the legislative branches, where they can issue some decisions that are contrary to their interests because the costs of disobeying those interests or of, say, packing the court or removing its formal powers are sufficiently high that it's easier in, in sort of a rational choice calculus to simply go with it, to lose every now and again. However, the courts themselves uh, as, a, as a corporate body have to make sure they don't go too far outside of what the executive wants, where the calculus shifts and um, all of a sudden the, the costs of mobilizing to say repress or ignore or reverse a court decision uh, are less than the cost of compliance. So we have these, these two competing ideas here. 
This is often known as uh, the concept of political fragmentation as well. So the idea that courts in any given legal system are independent of executive or political partisan political authority to the extent that there is a lack of political will or a difficulty in mobilizing to overturn their decisions. And finally, something that I imagine most of us have some sort of familiarity with um, in terms of at least the US literature, the idea that judges are just like anyone else, they have political ideologies, they have an idea of how they think the world ought to run, and those beliefs, those preferences impact how they adjudicate. In the context of appeal applications, uh, or leave applications, I should say, we would think more liberal, liberal or progressive judges would be more likely to grant applications because one, they would be running contrary to party capability theory, looking to advance the little guy, looking to sort of change the status quo, be progressive. Conversely, conservatives would be more likely to dismiss applications, so don't open up the law um, to, to change, particularly on the basis of changing social values, and an overall preference for maintaining the status quo. In terms of operationalization, um, we have a nice, we have a very handy um, metric here, insofar as basically every application for leave to appeal advances either a substantial injustice uh, slash or otherwise point uh, or ground of appeal, as well as a point of law of general or public significance. Um, and broadly speaking, the, the decisions on leave applications actually reference both and say which one or both has been uh, granted, which has been dismissed. So clear variable here, if the issue raises, or if the appeal raises a point of law, it gets a one, we would expect it to be more likely to be granted. If it doesn't, it gets a zero. Uh, the presence of the chief justice is a little bit more complicated, um, but we, we get the idea here that the chief justice is, regardless of personal ideology, concerned about the integrity of the judiciary as an institution, so less willing to rock the boat, as it were, more finger more on the pulse of the, the political or structural dynamics that are shaping judicial independence. And they would more likely to be more likely to issue a, something of a conservative decision in order to rein in the independence um, of the judges sitting both on their own court and in the courts below them. Finally, the, the most I think uh, tenuous of the of the variables I constructed and the most tenuous of the the theoretical points that I tried to operationalize here is the concept of judicial judicial ideology in Hong Kong. There is, to the best of my knowledge, no sort of traditional quantitative empirical work on the Hong Kong courts um, at a judge based level. Um, our commentator, uh, Stuart Hargreaves, has, has done some work on court decisions. Uh, some very interesting work quite recently on the, the rise of decisions of the court in merits cases, but the, the sort of application of US style methodology where you're looking at sort of the individual voting patterns of, of judges and, and attempting to characterize them as sort of leaning one or the other way doesn't really exist. And there are a variety of, of procedural reasons for this. Uh, the relative lack of dissents um, seriatim opinions, making it somewhat difficult to clearly characterize. Um, and I discussed this a little bit more in, in, a, in a paper that is a, a corollary to this presentation. So I've, what I've gone with is sort of a, a tentative idea that um, Bokhari is probably the most liberal of the judges who's ever sat on the court in a permanent capacity. Lytton is probably the most conservative. Um, this is supported by a comparison of, of leave applications. Um, and if you take a look over here, this is a simple table calculated on the on the basis of um, the number of leave applications granted when an individual is present and when they are absent uh, from the court. So say the first highlighted, uh, so this is during the Lee era, Bokhari, when um, Bokhari was absent, um, 19.7% of uh, application, or I should say a difference of 19.7 percentage points. Uh, so 
I believe when he was absent, we're looking at something in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 percent of applications were granted. When he was present, it was more in the uh, 30 to 35 percent range. Uh, we see the reverse being true for Lytton, um, and the same holds in the Ma and Chomira. So what I've done here is Lytton is negative one, Bukhari is positive one. If both are absent or both are present, it's zero. This is how we've calculated the ideology of the court. Um, and here's where we get to the, the big nasty uh, regression uh, model. So I've used logistic regression because our outcome here is simply leave application granted, it gets coded as a one, leave application dismissed, gets coded as a zero. Um, I've used several models. I won't go into explaining all of them, but uh, basically speaking, I've, I've reported odds ratios here. So one means that there's no difference for a one unit change. Two means that um, a one unit change. So if we're looking at, say, the chief justice being present um, in, or in a constitutional matter, we have a 2.8, which means that the uh, likelihood of success or the likelihood of a leave application being granted is 2.8 times more likely um, if it's a constitutional matter than if it's not. That's how you interpret this. Uh, these um, these coefficients. What we see here is that capability score is positively correlated. So the higher the capability score, the more advantaged the litigant relative to the, uh, or sorry, the applicant relative to the respondent, the more likely they are to succeed. The same is also true um, in terms of a point of law. In fact, more than three times more likely if you raise a point of law than if you raise a substantial injustice. The chief justice is the reverse. When the chief justice is present, it's about half as likely um, that leave will be granted. Um, ideology of the court is as we expected as well. Um, more liberal panel, more likely to be granted. Uh, more conservative panel, less likely to be granted. Um, constitutional positively correlated. This also runs in line with the point of law, this idea that the court is attempting to be an, an apex court in the traditional law or common law legal development sense rather than cassation. We would expect them to, to look at constitutional issues more. Uh, criminal as well, which is, is, is somewhat interesting. Um, also, in the Ma era, the court is more likely. Chung is not significant, but there's only a few... I think about 38 or 40 uh, leave applications heard during the Chung era in the data set. So we're not entirely clear. Um, the sort of the, the broad takeaway here is that everything we thought would matter seems to matter, uh, except counsel and silk, which don't. Now, there's two reasons for that, I think, or two possible explanations for that. One is that everything that is really relevant in terms of legal representation is actually being accounted for by the self-representation score. And it doesn't matter how many lawyers you have, it's just whether or not you have legal representation. As long as you do, um, we can say that the quality of the Hong Kong bar is such that um, even if there are, and I mean, I'm sure there are better or worse lawyers, um, the variation is so far at the top end and it's so little relative to the, the difference between having a lawyer and not having a lawyer, that it simply is statistically insignificant. I mean, we should all perhaps you know, be willing to pay higher fees for a, for a QC or an SC, or not as the case may be, but broadly speaking, as long as we're getting someone been called, who's been called to the bar, we'll be okay. The other is, it's simply not a numbers thing. Um, that more lawyers doesn't mean better legal representation. Um, and this is where sort of the data availability issues uh, come into play. Looking at somewhere in the vicinity of 500 different counsel who have appeared in um, uh, leave applications and being able to track down each one of those uh, to develop a metric of say previous wins, um, their experience in terms of uh, say education, anything along those lines is, uh, effectively prohibitive, at least at this stage of the appointment for the amount of research assistance I have, which is me. Um, going forward, I think developing something in this neighborhood would be uh, would be a good idea. Um, at present, I think I just uh, it, it's just necessary for practicality to, to stay with what we have. Um, 
one other thing I would point out that, that came up is quite interesting um, is the significance of, I'm going to preface myself here, the significance of having a female uh, barrister in criminal cases. Um, there are some interesting theories why. Uh, I would like to look at it a little bit more. One idea might be something alongside the ethic of care, right? that this, women are better able to clearly express sympathy to bring about the, uh, the sort of clear horror of the injustice, something along these lines. Uh, it might be some sort of interaction between uh, female justices and uh, liberal ideology, which is also both of which have been suggested and shown in some empirical evidence in other jurisdictions. But it is something I think I would like to, to take a look at a little bit more. And I would be very interested to hear ideas on this because it is, generally speaking, a very under theorized sort of part of, of um, party capability theory, but also litigation more generally, understanding the role of gender in the courts. So just to give you a, a brief idea of what some of this look like, look like I prepared some predicted probability models. And so this is using the litigant model, the first uh, uh, regression model reported. And the party capability score, negative four to four, is down here. Um, over here, we have the probability of success, so of leave being granted, based on the chief justice being present here and absent here, uh, with all other variables held at their mean. What we see is a pretty consistent um, distinction between the two, right? Uh, when the CJ is absent, the predicted probability is always going to be higher. And as we move up party capability scores to the point where positive four would be um, the criminal or the director of public prosecutions or their representative um, appealing a, a criminal case against uh, an individual litigant where we see something approaching 60% likelihood. And this, there is a, a significant degree of variation in noise in the, in the actual, um, actual data, but broadly speaking, um, they, they are not so different as to suggest that the models are radically incorrect. Although the explanatory, the proportion of explained uh, variation is, is relatively low in this model, it strongly suggests that this explains some of the variation. There's a lot of other stuff going on, um, which I would hazard a guess relates to legal explanations, precedent, some other omitted variables. So in no way should should um, what I've been presented here be taken to suggest that law has no relevance. Judges are just doing what they want. What we're talking about here is cases at the margins, and we're debating how big those margins are where judicial discretion actually applies. Um, along the same lines, if we take a look at public uh, public law matters, where we have a very conservative court over here, particularly when the chief justice is president, we have an almost nil probability um, of leave being granted as we get um, chief justice being absent and a very liberal court, we have something approaching 70% probability. And again, this there is variation in here uh, compared to the the actual data, but it's really not so far off as to suggest that it's not a reasonable approximation, albeit missing the legal explanation approach of things. I've summarized most of uh, what's gone in the, on in the results and discussion here. I'll leave that up for you. Um, and I'm very interested to hear what our commentators have to say, uh, as well as your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Evan. Really fascinating uh, presentation. Um, and thank you for the visuals. I actually thought they were very helpful. Um, so much appreciated. Uh, let me now turn uh, to Stuart for some comments. Stuart, please. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Evan, for sharing the paper. Um, I really did enjoy reading it, although I confess that some of the uh, statistical stuff was was beyond my um, my capabilities. But uh, the other parts, I, I really kind of sucked my teeth into. Um, I, I think I agree with you when I you know, it's always important for, for all of us in Hong Kong, I think, to, to try and understand better um, what the CFA is doing and, and why um, they do it. So with that in mind, I'm going to offer um, two brief comments, which I hope are, are somewhat useful to you. Now, I, I realize that the draft of the paper I read that was circulated to me previously is uh, an older draft. And so I think actually you may have addressed some of these um, issues already, but I'll, I'll kind of go through them anyway, just in case there are aspects that are still um, useful for you. 
So my, my first comment is a general one. A big part of the, the takeaway from the paper for me was to, to talk about the agenda setting role of the court. And of course, that's why you choose to focus on the um, on the appeals committee rather than you know the substantive merits uh, cases in, in their entirety. Um, but I, when I was reading it, I thought that the paper's analysis of that agenda setting aspect is perhaps better addressed or more clearly addressed in the paper by the later parts of the paper where you focus on um, judicial ideology and the disclosed grounds of appeal and so on, rather than um, the early discussions about party capability. So I guess I was thinking sort of, you know, if, if ju judges are, are influenced by factors like status of the parties, presence of silks, familiarity, and so on, um, I kind of felt like that was a separate question from the agenda setting um, aspect, because the agenda setting aspect seems to have that, or imply at least a, a far more sort of conscious process on the part of the judges about, you know, to which cases they they grant leave. Um, so that's that's sort of an initial thing that I that I that I thought about. Um, on the application of party capability theory to the court, I also wondered if the focus on the appeals committee means that some relevant considerations may be um, excluded. So as as you note in your paper, the cases um, often end up for final determination by the CFA through other routes, right, such as leave granted by the Court of Appeal. Um, but when we focus only upon the Appeals Committee, then I think the data set is slightly incom incomplete, perhaps. Um, so for instance, QCs, or I guess cases now, um, you know, overseas cases are, are drafted in um, sometimes only for the substantive final appeal heard before the CFA, even if they haven't um, taken part in the matters below, like including seeking leave to appeal. So Lord Panic. Um, for example, was added as counsel in both QT and W, but only at um, the very final stage. He had no role in convincing the courts of appeal to to grant leave. So, if there if there is a bias amongst members of the court towards you know better resource litigants, or whether or not the presence of a silk does or doesn't matter um, to the outcome, then I wonder if that might be better revealed through considerations of uh, a larger data set that, that might include those substantive uh, final decisions as well. Though I recognize, as you said, that you have know, limited um, resources for, for research. Um, on that point, actually, um, it also strikes me that the presence of uh, an appointed overseas silk might be a, a separate variable um, to consider. My second comment um, focuses on the uh, paper's contribution regarding judicial ideology. Um, and again, here, this may be the, the aspect that I think you may have already addressed uh, in, the, in the newer draft. I agree entirely that ideology in, in terms of the judges in Hong Kong is, is largely unexplored and I think very, very interesting. Um, I agree that it certainly must be the case that ideology matters um, to, to a certain degree, though again, perhaps even more significantly at the final decision stage. But I, I have some questions about the methodology used to um, determine it in the paper, which again, I think you, you acknowledge yourself. So since they're, as, as you note, they're not the obvious signals stemming from the appointment process in Hong Kong that you know other jurisdictions that might have. Um, the, the draft of the paper that I read uh, proposed to assign an ideological weighting to um, the Chief Justice and Justice Bokari, I think in the new version you said it's it's Justice Litton and Justice Bokari, uh, yeah, with the former tilting towards conservative and the latter tilting towards liberal for want of kind of better identifiers, better labels. And then all other members of the appeal committee presumably are deemed, statistically speaking, as, as falling between these two poles and thus are non-ideological, again, from the, the perspective of the statistics. Um, so the approach, like, Again, the approach in the draft that I read means that all three, three chief justices are assigned the same ideological score as a result of the position, whereas Justice Bukhari is assigned a, a liberal or progressive score as a result of, you know, kind of analyzing his output. Now, it sounds, again, that if you change that to, to Litton, I think that that makes more sense. But still, it means that the, the other judges who have sat on the appeals committee are essentially given no ideological rating, um, regardless of their judicial histories. Um, and so the paper has argued that the chief justice is, is more likely to be aligned, ideologically aligned to the status quo because they're assigned by the political branch. And of course, while this is true of, of all the judges, um, the paper suggests that it's likely to be more true or particularly true for the chief justice because of the public nature of their position um, and their administrative role. But 
for me, it could be just as plausible to say that the Chief Justice has a preference towards rejecting appeals to leave, not because of an ideological question about the law, but rather because he sort of has an overriding bureaucratic interest in limiting the caseload of the bench. And again, I understand you may now be separating, separating that out, and I think that makes sense if, if that's what's what's happening. Um, but for the, for the other judges, I still think there are questions to be answered. So Justice Chan, right, is assigned a non-ideological statistical score. Yet, you know, he wrote in W what was regarded as a, a relatively conservative dissent. So why would we not expect that ideology to also be a factor or to include that ideology in our calculations of, of his role when he sat as a member of the Appeals Committee? Anyway, so the, my general point is to say that if the paper is trying to, to sort of deeply consider the influence of ideology on decision making by the Appeals Committee, which I think is a great uh, thing to investigate, I think it does need to develop um, a, a, a more uh, complex, perhaps, way of assigning an ideological uh, score. So given the infrequency of, of dissent, as you note, um, this might involve an analysis of, of judges' opinions at low levels or, or something, but it probably is, I think, uh, a necessary step. A final small point um, I wish to add, uh, connected, I think, in part to the to this, is that if the agenda setting argument um, is to be made out, I think the situations in which the Chief Justice sits on the appeal committee um, should be explored in a bit more detail. So you note in the paper that it's it's relatively infrequent compared to the permanent members, but presumably the Chief Justice has a particular interest in, in shaping the court's agenda. And so we're trying to determine the situations in which the Chief Justice chooses to sit on the appeals committee, I think would be um, an interesting aspect to explore. So um, those are all my comments. I, I really did enjoy um, reading the paper. I think it offers a great, uh, an interesting contribution, and I hope to see it in print one day. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you very much. Um, should I should I respond, or would you would you like to go? As well? um, if, if it's all right with you, Evan, maybe we'll. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions, and then we're getting a couple of questions in the chat. Perhaps I can pose all of those to you, and then I'll give you one final chance to respond to whatever you see fit. Um, I'd like you to get as much feedback as possible. Um, so my my comments are very similar to Stuart's. I I, um, um, I I won't say the ones that are exactly the same, but I did have some slightly different questions with respect to judicial ideology. Um, the first is about how judges are assigned to the appeals committee, because my impression is that it's not random. And so that raises the question, especially for Justice Bukhari, who's now retired, and I think has some discretion in terms of the kinds of cases he hears. Um, it seems that he would just be on a lot more of the public law ones, the public law applications, which sort of raises questions about, you know, you showed the graph about the public law applications being much more likely to succeed if the chief justice isn't on it. But is that just because Justice Bukhari is on like a, a sort of a broader percentage of those? And similarly, I wonder if Justice Bukhari then is generally more likely to favor leave applications, or he just favors public law applications, those are the ones he's on. So I had a question about kind of the randomness of these of these um, assignments generally, right? And especially with respect to a retired justice like, uh, like Bukhari, who may have a bit more um, sort of flexibility in terms of what he's put on and what he even may choose to be on. Second question, um, again, going off of something Stuart said, was about the institutional explanation for the Chief Justice uh, being more conservative, right? So I, I, I take the point that, you know, the Chief Justice is the, the appointment of the Chief, so in choosing a Chief Justice, you choose someone who's likely to be sort of preservationist, shall we say, of the institution, has the proper role of the judiciary in mind. Um, and, you know, as the head of the judiciary, they may feel this kind of institutional responsibility. But a little bit like with my comment about Bokhari, I, I see how that maps on to leave applications with respect to public law. But I, I don't sort of fully see why that would be true, for instance, of a criminal law application or a private law application, right? It seems to me that the institutional stakes in those cases would generally be lower, especially for private law cases. Criminal law cases maybe recently have become more, um, a little bit more sort of salient in a way that the Chief Justice might not like. But again, historically, shall we say, uh, maybe in the first decade of, of the HKSAR, it's not clear to me why those would raise these kinds of institutional hackles on the Chief Justice. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about why we would expect the Chief Justice to be more conservative in those non-public law areas. 
Um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about Rule 7. There's something you'd mentioned too much in the, in the presentation, but it's really important, right? So in 2001, this new procedure came into, into force where the registrar of the court can essentially dismiss applications. And 90% of applications are dismissed this way. Um, and I wonder, like, I get the impression that neither you nor anyone really knows much about this, right? That is that there aren't written reasons given, but do we know anything about the procedure? Like, is there, is there criteria uh, that are used? Um, are there lawyers that are consulted? The reason I'm getting to this is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how much of that, how much the rule seven dismissals have a role in agenda setting versus just getting rid of just blatantly unmeritorious applications, right? So is this just a, a way to, uh, to weed out bad applications or does some of the um, agenda setting also happen here? Because if that's 90% of the applications, um, it does seem quite significant to know um, a little bit about that. So anything you can add about sort of rule seven dismissals, I'd be very interested to hear. So those were my, oh, we have another graph. Um, so yeah, there are, there are a couple issues with that. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to this in a bit, but just to, just to throw it up for, for, uh, for some viewing while we go through questions. Terrific. Um, and so we have two questions in the chat, which I'll just, I'll just give to you now. Um, and then I think we don't have too much time left, so we'll invite you after that to, uh, to respond. So the first is from uh, Samuel Yao, who says, my question is whether or not the presence of the chief justice in a leave application is, me, is, is dependent on whether um, it was an intentional excuse to allow an appeal or whether his schedule was too busy and thus to give um, CA decisions a greater role in Hong Kong. Okay. The second question is from P.Y. Lo. Hi, P.Y., nice to see you. Um, the paper tends to suggest and confirm that the Chief Justice has an agenda setting role. This might not be confirmed in relation to Chief Justice Ma. This is because he was conflicted to sit in applications um, if the CA decision was from a bench that included his wife who sat on the, the Court of Appeal. So over to you, Evan, thanks again. Great, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Ron. Uh, and thank you to uh, Samuel and uh, Piwilo. Um, so I'll try and try and wrap this up, I think, in uh, what do we have, eight, eight or nine minutes? Um, hopefully shorter than that. So I think, Stuart, you're right. Yeah, we have, uh, we have, like... we have 11 minutes. So anyway, go on. Oh, all right. So I, I, I do think that um, as this, as this uh, sort of project has morphed the it started as a party capability paper and I thought I'd just throw a few things at the wall in terms of ideology and, and see if I could make that work um, and that has turned out to be the the more interesting side of things um, so a, a reworking in that regard I think is, is probably a good idea and along with that um, I, I, I think you are you are correct um, classifying everyone else as uh, all of the judges other than Lytton, whoever's filling the role of Chief Justice in Bokhari as non-ideological is, is problematic. Um, and it, it's, it's running against a, a sort of hard line here. On the, on the one hand, um, it, is, it works, which is, is, is one thing. Um, and it's not to suggest that um, no one else is ideological. It's that in taking a look at the, the descriptive data, the, the summary statistics sort of where where we see uh, granting versus um, dismissal rates change, those are the two most prominent. Um, so we, we get into an issue of assigning the relative weight. And this is where the the relative dearth of um, of dissents, even in the merits uh, merits decisions comes in comes into being. Because if we're trying to calculate on a relatively simple value, sort of um, what in the U.S. context would be called the median justice, uh, it becomes difficult because we don't have enough variation. There's not enough dissents to figure out who is more conservative than who, or who at least sits on, even if we're not talking about liberal conservative in the traditional sense, uh, one or two, even two dimensions of variation. We can't pl start plotting people on that because we don't simply don't have enough data. It's, it's not really possible to apply sort of ideal point uh, estimation or, or Martin Quinn scores that would come out of the US. Uh, so that's unfortunate. 
I think probably going into a more in-depth qualitative study of the decisions might be effective. Um, one other idea I had, um, which has, has been used in limited sense before, would be effectively crowdsourcing, would be, say, doing a survey of, of legal professionals in Hong Kong. Um, how conservative would you rate each of these judges on the... So the, the main thing from a, from a methodological point of view is to make it not me making the decisions. So there's no suggestion that somehow I'm, you know, running a million regressions in the background and figuring out what works best and then pasting on the theory to make it make sense. But actually do it in this way. So I think that that's a possibility as well. Um, and I'm trying to balance here between sort of the the necessity we all feel to get things out the door, get things on the CV, and to do as good a paper as you can, as good a research as you can. And I think the way to do it here, at least I'm hoping, is to package up something close to what I have with some modifications and then continue on with the project. Because my plan next is to actually work on the merit decision, merits decisions. And I think you're right. And I think um, that will hopefully lead to a little bit more um, and we'll have a bit more uh, nuance in it, especially with the inclusion of, um, of foreign judges and the bringing in of, of QCs rather than SCs, or, or you get a bit more variation. Um, that, I think, goes along with the idea of, oh, yeah, inclusion of overseas. So uh, something that, um, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute. Yes, so all points well taken. Um, and yeah, the idea of, of when does the Chief Justice sit and composition is something that I haven't really been able to determine much about. To the best of my knowledge, um, it is solely at the discretion of the Chief Justice. Some of this is going to be, um, I think, as, as Samuel asked, it's just going to be scheduling. Chief Justice has more to do. Um, they have a, a more public presence. I assume they're working more directly with the registrar to deal with things like um, uh, rule seven and just general oversight of the judiciary. They have some administrative responsibilities in that regard too, but that can't explain all of it. Um, so figuring out what is going on there, I think is something that needs to be done probably qualitatively. Um, and that will probably be the next step in, in this project is reaching out to see, um, if, if someone will talk to me now, traditionally, I don't have a lot of experience here. Uh, but traditionally, judges are somewhat unwilling to, to talk to, to academics in, in a formal sense like this. Uh, we, we will see, um, or at least perhaps even the, the, the registrar will be able to give some sort of formal standard press, press response. And I think incorporating that into the analysis um, is, is, is a definite necessity. Um, moving to uh, Rehan's uh, comments. Uh, and I think actually uh, the, the point raised by Piwilo as well, uh, conflicted out for Ma, yeah, that's a distinct possibility as well. Um, although we do actually see a higher likelihood in the Ma era more generally of, of being granted. So even though he's sitting in there as a chief justice role, uh, compared to the Lee era, uh, it's, a, it's a much greater likelihood of granting. So I'm not entirely sure how that works. You also don't see a huge amount of variation in their appearance on the uh, on the appellate committee um, in terms of proportion of cases uh, between Lee and um, uh, between Lee and Ma. Uh, in terms of why it would matter, why the ideology would matter in terms of um, criminal or, or civil uh, as opposed to public, I think you're right. And I think actually the, to move back here, you take a look at the model here. Um, so, at the bottom here, you can't really use a standard R square. R square is problematic enough with linear regression, with logistic regression, it's it's almost useless. But we have proportional reduction in error. So this is how much how much better the model is than randomly guessing at success. And we see relatively low percentage. So we're clearly explaining something significant in the holistic models. Um, I mean, ten percent better is nothing to sneeze at, uh, but it's also not exactly phenomenal. When we move strictly to public, what we what we see is uh, over 30%. And I think you're right. I think some of what's being reflected in the big model is actually just public law uh, driving it. 
because it gets absolutely horrible in it's a, effectively a useless model in in private lives explaining you know one to two percent of the variation it, it doesn't matter criminal still matters <clears throat> so one possibility going forward is to actually say that listen there's different factors at work we need to break these down um, and at least from a comparative constitutional law perspective, which is sort of, I think, where most of us are coming from, at least those of us I can see on the screen, um, that's what kind of what we care about anyways. Um, and these are the places where the court can have the most influence politically. Um, so I'm encouraged by that, uh, but I think possibly breaking it out into those three and discussing them separately um, is, is a sensible idea. Um, yeah, overall, uh, I, I, th I think this has been great. Uh, I'm very, very appreciative of, of everyone's comments. I'm, I'm glad no one yelled at me that I was, uh, you know, destroying the law and uh, removing all of the value from it, something along those lines. Sometimes uh, legal communities get a little bit upset when you when you uh, operationalize things in this way. Um, but I, I, I do want to sort of drive home the fact that in no way am I suggesting that there, there's not a lot of law going on. In fact, I think, as we can see with this relatively limited explanatory capacity, uh, we're talking about the margins here. We're not talking about judges doing whatever they want to do whenever they want to do. That's not the suggestion. It's the we're talking about the hard cases here uh, where judicial discretion does start to matter. Um, and I think that's the interesting thing to 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 look at. And that's what social science methodology can offer law here not answering you know, uh, some sort of predictive algorithm about whether or not you're going to be found guilty. Evan, sorry, uh, thanks very much. Just, I want to invite you quickly in case you, in case you uh, wanted to, to comment on the rule seven uh, issue. Oh yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, with rule seven is- um, This one, yeah. Yeah, so I've been able to locate the issuance of rule seven orders back as far as 2012. What I've had trouble tracking down is the results of those orders. Um, so even this, so I've presented here um, the distinction between criminal and civil cases. And if you'll notice since uh, second half of 2019, we've got this massive spike up to something in the neighborhood of uh, 300 per six months uh, in civil. I've done some preliminary looking there. Most of it seems to be um, appeals related to uh, immigration board decisions or or uh, the what's the name of the anti torture um, administrative tribunal. Then the appeal goes to the high court, and then it goes directly from the high court up. So that's why we see this massive uh, decline. Um, there's a huge there's a lot of variation in criminal. But over time, you would draw your, your sort of mean round about the same place across 2015. Um, the issue is I have it in the aggregate on an annual basis, whether or not um, and what proportion of Rule 7 claims are ultimately admitted. I don't have it disaggregated. Um, and that is a bit of a problem. Um, I've, I've talked to the registrar about this. They, um, they haven't been too forthcoming with disaggregated data. It's not entirely surprising. Uh, so I think, at least for present purposes, this will go along with recrafting the paper uh, as, as Stuart has suggested, which is to make it more about agenda setting. At the, at the end of the day, there's not a huge amount of control over the, that the court has over the other paths to, to appeal. They do have clear control over this one. So to the extent that they are able to set the agenda, it would be looking at there. I, th I think it's going to have to be a constrain rather than a collect more data, uh, at least at, at this juncture. Um, but also the, the leave applications I found, none of them are uh, none of them are OCR either. So they would need I would need to go through them manually. And it's just I mean, we're talking 15, six or actually 1800 applications, about half of which are solely in, in Chinese. So um, there, there are some logistical problems there as well. Terrific. All right. Well, thanks again, Evan. This was really fascinating. Thank, thanks very much, Stuart, as well, for the comments.